Under the proposed contract, a year nine firefighter, so this person might be under 30 years of age uh, if they start it right out of high school, but a year nine firefighter starts with a base salary, which is somewhere in the 90, some thousand range. I'm not going to get into particular numbers. The exact numbers don't matter for purposes of this discussion. On, now that is based on a presumptive 2,184 hour work year, which is 91 24 hour shifts, which the way the contract, the, the, the uh, schedules go, is firefighters work a 24 hour shift, then they're off the next three days, and they work again, and so forth through the year. When you do the math on a 365 day year, that gives you 91 shifts in a little plus or minus. So everything is premised on that. Within that, they get, this is the year nine firefighter, will get 240 hours of vacation time. Well, that's the equivalent of 10 shifts. So from your 91, I'll call them shifts. From your 91 shifts, take 10 for vacation. You are entitled to 180 hours of sick time. That's 7.5 shifts. So now we're up to 17.5 shifts from your 91. Holiday pay is built into your base. So you already have six, the equivalent of six shifts built into your base pay. Beyond that, a new provision, baffling to me, is an extra two bonus days. Just no explanation given, but two bonus days. So 10, 7.5 is 17.5, plus six, 23.5, plus two, 25.5, and you get one personal day, 26.5. Back that out from your 91, and your 91 shifts, in reality, in terms of the compensation that you get in these different categories, is based on a 60, do the math real quick, 60, plus say 66 shift year. Dramatically different. That represents a, the 26 shifts represents something in the neighborhood of 27 or 28 percent of the entire work year is through vacation, sick, holiday, and personal time. I don't, again, if you look at last contract, you say, okay, well, that's not really a change or a very small change. Forget that. I, I have to start because I've spent my entire career, except for a very brief, brief period of time, in the private sector. And I know in my field of law, what people pay and how much vacation time is normal and how much sick time and all the other categories. And I know people who are in the casino industries. And I know people who are executives or middle managers in a lot of other industries. It's not a question of, you know, is, are these numbers close to what society as a whole gets? They're, they're just not. I mean, they're, they're way, way, way in excess of anything that I've, I'm familiar with anybody getting. Now, second example, the fire official. Now, the city made a decision some time ago that the fire official, who is required to have certain licensures in order to do certain inspections, would be a uniform member of the fire department. They don't have to be. But that was a decision the city made and has continued. So the fire official coming out of the fire department and doesn't have to be an officer, can be, could be a firefighter, I assume, if you have the right licensures. But the fire official, where the 2,184 yearly total is uh, premised on a rough, an average 42-hour work week, the fire official only has to work a 36-hour work week. Not sure why that is, but there's no explanation I've heard for that. The fire official, by reason of being the fire official, gets an automatic 12% bump in pay from whatever was the base pay. So the firefighter would get a 12% bump to take him or her, him, to the level of the next level up, which would be lieutenant. A lieutenant would get a 12% bump to equate to captain's salary. That's on, based on the base pay, another 12% to be the fire official. The fire official is off and doesn't get charged any vacation time when City Hall is closed. So the fire official works a four-day week, four nine-hour days, but also gets off anytime City Hall is closed. And as we know, City Hall is closed with some frequency uh, for holidays of different kinds. The fire official gets vacation based on, of course, the firefighter's contract. If the firefighter is an officer, the officer's numbers for vacation 
are better, higher, than the uh, corresponding numbers for a firefighter. Specifically, an officer, a lieutenant, in years 9 to 15 under this contract, gets 288 hours of vacation time a year. 288 hours on a 36-hour work week equates to eight full weeks. So the fire official gets eight full weeks of vacation, and that's at that level. When you reach the level of 16 years of service, if you're a lieutenant, you get 13 days or 312 hours. If you're a captain, you get at the 9 to 15 level, that's 13 days or 312 hours. At 16, you move up to 14, I call them days, shifts, or 336 hours of vacation. But when you apply it to the fire official, that's eight weeks of vacation. Plus, they get, depending on where they are in seniority, either 120 or 180 hours of sick time. I, again, the function is an important one, of course. We need a fire official. The fire official does not have to be a uniformed member of the department. And does the fire official really require such a rich package? I, I don't understand that. And finally, we have the differential of 12%. There's always been, or not always, there has been in the recent contracts at least, a differential where there's a 12% bump in pay when you move from firefighter to lieutenant, and then another 12% when you move from lieutenant to captain. That continues. Again, I comparing it to the private sector, comparing it to my own experience, and granted, it doesn't correspond to the unique history of contracts in Brigantine and actually all through Atlantic County, because they're, they follow a very similar trajectory if you look at them over time. Um, but with that said, objectively looking at it, we are being extraordinarily carefree in our spending, I think. I don't think it's being unfair to ask that we need to take a hard look. Now, again, if, if people are going to say there's no point in doing that because the arbitrator will never hold it up, that's fine. I guess you could say that. I cannot understand how one justifies the, the levels of compensation that we're talking about. I understand how we got here, and I also understand the argument that says once you're here, you're stuck, but it, it is kind of mind-boggling to me. I think the other thing that strikes me is, <clears throat> in addition to what Rick says, at being out of stride with the private sector, when you look at what's happening to our local economy, you can see how far out of step it is. Even in other areas of uh, other municipalities, there have been cutbacks and givebacks in the public sector. But in the private sector, people are taking pay cuts and losing their jobs. These are the people who pay taxes. Even though here in Brigantine, we're kind of skewed a little bit because the majority of people who pay taxes don't live here, okay? Most of the people that do are not one percenters, but they're people who are struggling, and people who are not only struggling, but losing the battle and having to move off the island because of taxes. So we have on one hand a tremendous compensation package that is the result of a long-standing history, and there's no way or strong desire on anybody's part, at least of all the firemen, to have any give backs to the city and, you know, they've benefited from it for so many, many, many years. But the benefits go on and on and on and on and on. And we're going to get to a point, sooner or later, where property values are going to start to drop because the tax burden is too high. And I don't know if we're at that tipping point now. But even those who are in the upper brackets will not want to come here even part-time. Let me, if I could, um, Joe reminded me of one other thing. Talk about health benefits. We didn't, in this contract, and we didn't in the police contract, address the pending issue of the Cadillac tax under the Affordable Care Act. That's significant. That will come due, unless we indulge in what I fear is the fantasy that that's going to change or go away before then. That comes due as of January 1st, 2018. This contract will expire December 31st, 2017. So the next day, we are in that position of having to deal with the Cadillac tax. That requires, required, I would say, but it still certainly requires, 
a really hard look and some hard decisions about whether we dramatically revamp and reduce the health benefits package that we offer or look for a substantially greater contribution from the employees yeah. if, if it should be their choice to continue you know, with a higher but, level benefits. But you can't because the Cadillac tax says the tax has to be paid by the employer, not the employee. Well, true, you, That's the you would have to have give back somewhere else to offset that. Um, the other thing too, that in, in talking to the history of how we got here, which we can't ignore, is that the obligation for public employees to contribute to the cost of their health care benefits came in in the year 2010. That, for the first time, made it mandatory that there will be contributions, and it's on a sliding scale uh, based on, in part, on whether you're the first, second, third, or fourth year um, after the initiation of that, of that law, and the amount of money that you make and the cost of your health care, of the health care premium in total. The police, as I understand, paid that from year one because it was something that was imposed on every employee, even those in a bargaining unit, unless they were already under contract as of the effective date. The last contracts for the firefighters and the fire officers were signed off about five days before the effective date, which meant that what would otherwise have been four years of contributions on an increasing scale were no contributions. That has a magnitude in the hundreds of thousands of dollars. That was done for reasons I've never heard explained, and I don't know that there is a good explanation for it, but it happened. Now, under this contract, the firefighters basically start at the beginning in year 2014, it will be year one of the contribution, so it's at a relatively low level. It increases for year 2015 and then again over the next few years of the contract till it maxes out. But the magnitude of the health care costs, which had the last contract not been pushed through literally days before the effective date of the law, they would already have been, this, these bargaining units would already have been at the maximum um, fourth year participation and contribution. Um, we didn't get that money for the last four years. We got none of it. And now we are in years one and two. So again, we're falling short of what would otherwise have been the contribution. That's part and parcel of the history and the reality of where we are with this contract. 